Greetings everyone at the Q Economic International Forum. Um, my name is Zoya Lepini, founder of NGO Asutoria. And we have a small interview with the Vice Prime Minister Ivo Fedorov. Now let's see sad. You have to be straightforward in your goals and flexible in the way you achieve those goals. So our task was to talk to Mikhailo about the human capital. So we postponed and changed the timing three times, but then again. Um, so you have an ambitious dreams that you're discussing with the government. That's about uh, having more marginal uh, products in the national GDP of the company, about the uh, trends for victory. And uh, our president has uh, just men mentioned that defense tech and military tech shall be the most powerful in Ukraine very soon. But for all those uh, goals uh, to be fulfilled, we need human capital. You're already making some first steps. Now, do we have the brains? Do you have the manual uh, labor enough to recover the economy to get the victory? Well, thank you for this question. Good afternoon, everyone. We do have a very powerful human capital. This is something that we can see even we, we saw before the large scale war. We can see that now we have I have a million of examples where you can see that clearly starting from the IT sector with over 300,000 people working and every year the number of people is growing that's particularly for that sector and the share of the IT expert what we are having right now in military tech last year when it started the army of drones there were only seven companies dealing with drones currently we have 200 companies uh, and we can see more and more startups uh, growing every day and on the brave one uh, cluster there was over 700 companies joining in for the project so if you're starting to create policy that opens the market, that reduces the role of the state, there is always a sort of a, a technological breakthrough, a breakthrough in the development of the people. So the potential is very significant and every country is fighting for, for its people because people are the most important. So the transformation of the state in terms of engaging human capital in the development, that will, some, that will be something that will have an impact on uh, our development, our economy, and the next hundred years of our development. So you're saying that we have the human capital, but the main tool for the development of human capital, that's the educational system. And you are, are kind of the one re responsible for the education sphere now. So whether the patient is dead or alive, and what was the motivation uh, to have education as part of the direction responsible for the innovation and development. Well, we already understand that today we're having a war in technologies. This is a war in real-time mode. I mean, everything is changing constantly. We need to analyze what is happening. We need to introduce new technologies, the UAVs, the electronic warfare equipment, Everything is full of technologies. Technologies help to save lives of our people and to engage enemy. And in the morning, I've seen reports on all the units using the UIVs. One of the units uh, killed over 100 pieces of equipment. We're talking about howitzers, armored equipment. That's, you know, unimaginable. These are the drones that were produced in Ukraine. I mean, one unit managed to destroy that amount of money, so uh, that amount of equipment. So that's the human capital. Now, talking about our future, currently GDP per capita in Ukraine, it's not something that I would call incentivizing. We all want to live in a country with uh, greater GDP. I personally would like to live uh, in a country with GDP over 60,000, well, or 70,000, or 100,000 dollars per per capita so that we would be among top 20 countries by this indicator. But what do we need to do? Which countries are generating this amount of GDP per capita? We're talking about the digital economy, the innovations, the high productivity of labor. We're talking about the capital with uh, large added value. Now, who creates these companies? Who works at those companies? And uh, this is where we start searching for a solution. How do we generate the human capital with people capable of generating, creating companies like that? 
What competences do those people need to generate the companies? Any skills they need, like soft skills they need? What should be the situation with the stamp, with the English language, and then? We're saying that if we want 100,000 GDP per capita, or at least 40,000 or 50,000, we need to change the education. And for that, we need to change the educational standards. They're combining certain requirements and the path towards the development of competences. Now, for that, we need to change the standards, the programs, etc. So there is a sort of kind of disbalance in terms of the level of GDP. And then we understand we need to implement those standards. Now, who can implement the standards? Definitely the people, the people who are kind of inspiring uh, the education. We have an example when, you know, when certain teacher has changed your life, got you into certain um, subject or the science, someone started business, someone started, you know, doing something for the science, for the, the programming or drawing. So there's a new question. How do we engage those people in the area of education with the new standards that will be uh, developing certain competences in order to reach high goals and having a large GDP per capita so that our community would be wealthy one. And then we have a question. We need to create conditions for those people to join the system because teachers are the most important. They are the ones to implement the standards and programs. They are the ones to infuse the hearts of our children. So that kind of clears out the path towards the reform of the education system. It, explains how do we have people, how do we transport, transform the management so they have freedom, how do we build the effective network in order to have uh, an accessible education for everyone so that there would be equality. So this comes up with a strategy. Uh, we already have this strategy and we're starting to kind of implement that. Now, talking about this strategy, What's the three top priorities that you want to achieve in education in the next five years? You were talking about the contents. You were talking about uh, the attraction of uh, the teachers. Well, first is to have humans, well, in the system, those who are capable of implementing the standards effectively and swiftly, because standards are the second element. And another thing, which is something that you wouldn't come up straightforward to that, but still, it might not be that popular as someone might think of, but that's the analytics and monitoring in real time mode. Because I think that we live in a world that is changing every second, so we need to respond to all the changes in a very fast way. For example, there is a new breakthrough in AI, there is the chat GPT. And if we want to be the most innovative nations in the world, we have to tell the whole country about the new technology to all the teachers, to all the children, to everyone, to, to, to the parents. And how do we achieve that? If we want to be the fastest country in terms of innovations, we have to you know, use mobile apps. We have to provide content for the for the teachers, explaining them what's the what's the AI, what's the changeability, how to teach children, and then to analyze to monitor the results of that. Now, when we started thinking about that, how do we build the fastest growing educational system? Because the educational systems will compete. So that's a new battle between the educational systems of the world, because they will be generating the human capital that is uh, in turn creating. Uh, the economy and creating more human capital. So we decided we need to have a digital product called Maria, and it will answer the question, what's happening with the standards that we've implemented? What's with the competences? What's with the math or English? And what do we have uh, with math in the fifth year of education or seven years of education? Then imagine we have a dashboard and in real time mode, we can see all the marks, all the dynamics, the effectiveness of standards, curricula, textbooks, teaching methods. And we can take managerial decisions like let's invest more in math or let's invest more in the development of English and uh, in which areas. And that will have an impact on policy making. So, you know, the future governments, they more like an IT ones.
the small governments that take swift and dynamic decisions. And therefore, we have to have a high quality information for taking managerial decisions. And once again, let's cut back to this transformation path. We want to have 100% uh, $100 thousand dollars of GDP per capita. We need to work with human capital. We want to develop certain competences for that mainly all labor. We need standards, we need programs, we need teach teachers, we need monitoring and analytics in order for us to understand we're taking the right path. In this case, we are developing certain vision for the reform. We have some tools on how to do monitor that. So that's the formula we have. Okay, that's a clear formula. Now, I have a more technical question, uh, but it's important for the human capital topic. You were saying about uh, the lack of information. There's not always that we can turn the available information into analytics for the management. In terms of analyzing the human capital, the data is very different. So we can be hearing like 5 million refugees, 7.5 million refugees. So the, the numbers are very different, not only in education, but everywhere. Now, the tool which is important for every country to assess the human capital, to assess the demographics, that's uh, the uh, calculation of the number of population. We uh, uh, were supposed to have a census in 2023. Uh, well, since uh, you have... Uh, uh, not only the education, but the statistics department under your management. So are you planning to have any census or to, uh, to, calcul uh, to calculate the human capital? Well, we are reforming the state statistics for every year. We want to turn it into the IT company so that they would be gathering uh, data in the real time mode in order to make uh, high quality managerial decisions. We've introduced an IT system used by one of the leading financial institutions. I cannot give you more details now, but we'll have the same system. It allows to gather uh, information uh, with, using alternative sources, not to you know get all the prices of the market, but get information for, from the digital uh, barriers of information to, to, to scan this information, to compare this information. And we're running a couple of researchers using this system that allowed us to reduce uh, the uh, human involvement in gathering the statistics by 20%. We shall continue the statistics. Indeed, we were planning to have a census in 2023. We were planning to have it done together with Apple. And we were planning to have certain innovations. We've just recently adopted a law that would allow us to have this zero stage of the census. That's the first step when we kind of verify the information in the registers. And then we understand the number of the people, we understand the structure of the people in kind of different from different perspectives. So now we have a clear understanding how do we do the census of the population? How do, do we do that in a modern way so that we'll have less people uh, kind of walking by the apartment so that all, all would be done all online so that a person might be providing this information by DIA. We've uh, uh, allocate. We, we, we've tried to develop how do we do that in accordance to the national and international statistics standards. We're ready for the census. We're doing some preliminary stages already when we verify the information in the registers. And we were, when we already have some quality information, we have some um, digital qualifier that starts to verify this information. So the public agencies are not, not uh, collecting the redundant information. For example, if you're coming to the hospital and you don't have a family doctor, but uh, they won't need still to input the information. So you just need to have an IPN and all the information for the demographic register would be introduced for the medics. We have an interesting case. We're calculating the number of children uh, that are kind of lost and how many children were abducted by Russia and thanks to the this registration we're trying to identify how many children left Ukraine then we have uh, an icon register uh, that shows how many children are studying at schools at universities and how many children were not active like economically active together with their parents we're talking about the IDPs or those who receive different types of certificates and we will see that and uh, the numbers will be catastrophic in terms of the number of children 
that are being lost. You know, they're no longer on the radars. They're being abducted by Russia. So that's one of the examples how you can count certain indicators. So surely the dynamics of uh, the internal migration is fairly significant. People are relocating between the migrants. People are uh, going abroad and coming back. So everything is very dynamic. It's hard to give the exact number of the people we have but there is also operators. We have a dashboard in real-time mode. We can see how many people are depersonalized and where they are. And this is the information for taking managerial decisions. What do we do with infrastructure? Which road to build? We're starting to develop in telecommunications. We can see the traffic and we can tell the operators. So, well, take this road, uh, like intercity roads. I'm not talking about the, the large roads like Kiev Chop, but the intercity roads, let's construct more towers there so that we would have a quality communication. Uh, I believe you're a sociologist by education and so you're very inspiring this topic. So you have a dream which about the most convenient country in the world and a lot has been done already and uh, surely the majority of the people in this audience, they can feel the advantage of those first steps you've made. What are the next steps you're planning to make in terms of the most convenient states and whether those next steps would be enough to maintain the human capital in the country and to return more capital for Ukraine. Well, I believe in the free economy when the role of the state is kind of reducing, there will be more freedom for the business, less regulation, more automation. So everything should be digitalized. There should be digitalized services. So our goal is to turn all services into a digital ones and not just to digitalize the bureaucracy. That's something I hate, but to do the re-engineering of the processes. And currently DIA has like or, or something around 20 million of users. Estonia is currently implementing their own products based on DIA. And some other countries are starting to implement DIA, but that's already the result of the product that's kind of added on result we're focusing on uh, further digitalization of services in ukraine that is why we have a lot of uh, revolutionary services we're currently doing the beta testing for the possibility to buy and sell car uh, uh, without you know the center of the ministry of interior without you know waiting for this long lines but to sell and buy the car in just a couple of clicks. We started mortgage programs, e-recovery. The uh, World Bank supports uh, further funding of this project uh, project because there is a register of the damaged property. Uh, everything is absolutely transparent. All the information is verified through the registers. So the future, and I just want to once again get back to the statement. The future uh, would come for those states where the government is taking fast decisions, where the business will have more freedom. And uh, I believe we can all see uh, Ukraine as uh, the country which has the largest freedom, where it's uh, very easy to start your business. And ideally, there would be a transaction model so that the uh, taxes would be calculated like in an automated manner. But it's our path. We need to identify our vision for the future it will help us to advise uh, let's dive deeper many uh, ukrainians are calling corruption as the major enemy of the recovery and you were mentioning some of the transparent solutions preventing the corruption and uh, there will be uh, like a, six, a package of 63 decisions to that any other examples look we have separate anti-corruption projects that we are working for. for example, the construction area, we've uh, neutralized Dumbi, we've uh, digitalized uh, a lot of entities and some new projects are starting without the corruption. We can see how all the permits are issued. They, the, uh, the electronic signature is assigned to every person, so you can't uh, falsify everything because there will be criminal liability for that. So we would still need one more law to be adopted and implemented and then at a local level they won't have any troubles like that so we can see that one of the most corrupted areas is transforming is becoming transparent
And so I personally believe that uh, because of education and through the instrument of education and unfortunate experience that we are living through right now, in a number of years, we will be able to step away from corruption mentally. It will not be a thing. We will not have to create a billion of different mechanisms to prevent corruption because it will not be a thing. But while we are on this path, we have to digitize everything as much as possible, makes everything as transparent as possible. That's what we are fighting for, this open data. And we have become the third country in Europe uh, in terms of the volume of open data. And we are only expanding that sector. We are currently working on the... Um, electronic excise sector because this is sort of a shadow market i have given an example of a possibility to buy and sell a car there's also this level of domestic corruption like a small level corruption but there's also a fight that we are fighting and i personally see that digitalization and complete automation so just removing the government official from the process removing this committees removing this collective responsibility collective liability from the procurement processes it will allow us to prevent corruption if we automize all of this and that's what that's what we are working on constantly thank you so much this definitely deserves a round of applause. Sir, I have promised to your team that we will let you go at 11.20 to meet the president. But I do want to ask you one question about the human capital in education. These are the professors, the teachers, the instructors. You have appealed to the audience saying that all of you have had this one instructor, one teacher who have ignited a flame in you. Who was that person for you, the mentor, the professor, the teacher? Well, I've had a lot of those people in my life and I keep finding them every year and every month month all of these people who are igniting this flame inside of me it can be a person or it can be a book even for me that ignites this flame in your heart but uh, i have been fortunate enough to have those people in university as well there was this one person who have opened this first opportunities for me to participate in commercial studies. And in my third year of university, me and my group mate, just the two people from our group have been selected to uh, carry out a marketing study for a tour agency. And that was a huge opportunity for me. I remember that very well. I worked so hard on it. And we have uh, worked on that marketing study and that helped the travel agency. And after that, my life changed again, again, because it keeps changing. But that was this fundamental step in my life because I saw how you can use your knowledge that you have accumulated over the years to make money and how you can produce results for businesses and other people. And this is a win-win situation that worked great because the person who identified out us as people capable enough ignited these flames in our hearts and that turned into our work and into our result and into the benefit for the project itself and this is one of the cases that i remember and i keep mentioning it because that's why i tell people that they have to seize opportunities but you have to have these people in your lives that ignite this flame and until we create the most favorable conditions for teachers and instructors for self-actualization, we will not be able to become the most digitalized and the most innovative country in the world. So we keep saying that a teacher has to become a rock star of sorts, has to become a person who mentors, who enters the room and captures attention and it takes the breath of the audience away. We have to make sure that these people get suitable opportunities. And there are a lot of these people. And then we see people who refuse to enter the system because they don't see suitable conditions. We have to create those conditions. The formula is very simple. It's just difficult to implement. And so I think that we are working with you and a lot of people present in this audience on this specifically. And we will inevitably reach this point. It is inevitable. So let's keep working on it. Thank you so much for interesting insights. Thank you for a great conversation. And we will continue the topic of human capital at 1230. Thank you all.